Good afternoon. Um, I, we apologize. We're starting a little bit late because the key keynote is still going on and some people are, are leaving, so we wanted to give people a chance to be here. But um, I want to thank you on behalf of the advisor committee and those people who have put this uh, conference together for being here. I want to thank our panel. And this is a session on policy measures to empower violence prevention in the military. Brian Greer, who is with the uh, ADL, is going to be the moderator. And um, I turn it over to you so you can introduce the panel and begin. I, one thing I do want to mention is there are a number of people who are online. So there are those who are live streaming, we welcome you. There are two QR codes on either side of the room. If you would like to ask a question, go to the QR code. Please type it in, and um, it will be, be up here uh, directly to our moderator. Ryan will get, get it and be able to get the questions at any given time. So Ryan, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for every, everyone who's in the room, everyone who's online. Again, thank you for your patience. Um, we're going to have this really important discussion with a number of policymakers on how we create policies to reduce extremism in the military. But first, I want to start with two special guests. Don and Rick Collins have graciously offered to give some remarks before we get started to help give kind of a story for the exact type of family who we are here to help. And so with that in mind, Don and Rick, please feel free to come take the podium and, and help us out with, help us get started. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for the summit. It has been wonderful. Thank you for allowing us to share our story. In 2017, a young, beautiful, handsome man was murdered at the University of Maryland College Park. It was determined that the person that murdered our son was a follower of the alt-right. He put a knife in my son's chest and he bled out on the campus of the University of Maryland College Park. So my, son, my husband and I said that that could not be the end of the story. We have had several initiatives, and my husband will expound on this. But the one thing that I want to add is that we are patriots. That's it. My son would have been third generation military. I am the daughter of a retired NYPD police officer for the city of New York. That's what that means. So. I get very, very adamant about that word patriot and what it means, because I am a patriot. And what I want to say, when my son was murdered, I ask, where were all these military veterans? My son was told that we are a family of one. So I'm asking. Where were those veterans in our lament? So in adding to what my wife said, uh, what we've been able to do uh, with the help of a lot of other good people is to uh, continue our son's legacy by establishing a foundation in his name. And we've had the good fortune of partnering with some outstanding people uh, from uh, Outward Bound nonprofit and also being able to get the support of a uh, major uh, private corporation, uh, Under Armour, to sponsor building uh, bridges. That's what we call the initiative. And what we've tried to do is bring together the ROTC cadets from the University of Maryland at College Park and Bowie State University, which is a historically black college and university in, in Maryland, and have them come together in an environment outside their normal military trainings and uh, give them a chance to get to know each other to see that you can come from a diverse background but still uh, realize that you have a lot more in common than you, than you do have uh, differences. So we've been uh, very fortunate that we had the first year of our uh, pilot program uh, to have them come together on a one-week expedition to the Appalachian Trail and where they had teams of students, 10 students from both uh, universities, come together and support each other 
in the in the wilderness with no cell phones and no technology, just themselves. Uh, they had to cook their own food and make their own campfires. So we're real proud of that. And we found that when they came back from this journey, whereas they kind of went out apprehensive, they came back and you know you could see the relationships and the bonds and friends they had made from that experience. So we're we're very proud and honored to be a part of that. And we're looking forward to next year's expedition to bring even more of these cadets together. And I will end by saying this. Again, my son, that was the happiest day of his life. And he was not a partial officer. He was a full military officer, a veteran of the United States Army. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story. <clears throat> I, I just want to start off by saying we're all so sorry for your loss. And I think it's so important to start with that story because we're going to talk about policy. We're going to talk about data points. We're going to talk about solutions at scale. Every data point we talk about is a family like the Collins who we can help prevent stories like that. So thank you. And with that, I want to thank uh, our, our panelists here today, and I'll, and I'll introduce them. Again, my name is Ryan Greer. I work for the Anti-Defamation League. And we're going to talk about policies to prevent extremism in the military. And I'm joined by some people who have just been absolute leaders uh, on this topic and related topics for many years. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce them, and then we'll have some opening statements. And then as a reminder, you know, we'll do questions and conversation. And if you have a QR code at your disposal, please do submit a question that we can use uh, to facilitate our discussion. So with that, I want to start with Jenny Preswala, uh, who is someone I've known for a long time and who has just made tremendous inroads in the terrorism prevention space. She's worked at the National Counterterrorism Center, Department of Homeland Security, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Department. Um, she now currently is the acting director for the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, or CP3, at DHS, which leads on terrorism prevention efforts uh, domestically. Uh, next to her, we have James Chappelle, who uh, is a, uh, has a, a deep background in military and intelligence, including uh, as a decorated Army officer. He and now currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Director for the Center for Threat Management and Analysis uh, at the Department of Defense Counterintelligence Center. I got that slightly wrong. He's going to correct me as we go. Uh, it's a long acronym, forgive me. Uh, moving over, we have Tom Brzezowski, who, you know, Again, we have tremendous military backgrounds here. He served as a JAG officer and currently serves in the Army Reserves. He has a background at the FBI as an Associate General Counsel, but currently serves uh, as Counsel for Domestic Terrorism at the Department of Justice. Uh, and lastly, but not least, certainly, Bishop Garrison, who uh, I had the pleasure of working with a bit when he was leading the effort at the Pentagon to figure out how do we deal with extremists in the military. Um, he's since left government, but has a decorated history in the national security and human rights space, including as a decorated army officer, West Point grad, uh, and is currently serving as vice president for government affairs and public policy at Paravision AI. So that's the esteemed panel we have. We're going to talk about policy, um, and I want to give everyone an opportunity to sort of share uh, an initial statement. So why don't we start with Jenny? Sure. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, hello to those of you joining us virtually. I do first want to say how inspired I am by your courage and your strength as a mother. It's really incredible, and I'm very moved by it. Um, you're why we do this work. I joined the department in 2006 and was also very moved by 9-11, as is everybody that joined the department. And in particular, as a South Asian woman, and the first hate crime committed after 9-11 was towards an Indian man at a gas station who was murdered. And my whole life, my family had such deep respect for the Sikh community in particular. And that was, it was really a double motivation to come into this work. Um, in 20. 22 this year the secretary announced the department's first policy to prevent violent extremism within the department um, several years before that we had had an active coast guard active duty um, an employee who had radicalized to white supremacy and was planning an attack in washington 
and that was disrupted, but then very concerning to not just the country, but also the department. We are the department in charge of preventing and countering terrorism in the United States, and we have people within our own department that are um, here supposedly to protect the country from terrorist attacks, and yet are at the same time radicalizing to violence. And what's interesting about the domestic terrorism threat is I think, for instance, we just had the first strategy to counter domestic terrorism ever in the United States with this administration. I think that shows how much we're catching up to recognize domestic terrorism as a true terrorism problem. That's finally happening. But I think even within the military, within the Department of Homeland Security, within government, there are people who sign up to protect the country from terrorism and don't necessarily see some of these domestic ideologies as terrorism. And so that's one really big issue we need to address in this country. I do work for the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. I am the acting director. Our office is within the larger Office of Policy in the department. Um, and we are tasked in particular with implementing the prevention section of the National Domestic Terrorism Strategy. Um, this administration and this secretary has taken big steps overall. We have the first, for instance, um, domestic terrorism branch of our intelligence and analysis section in the department for the very first time. The domestic terrorism threat, the FBI and Department of Justice have made this very clear, is the predominant threat in the United States right now when it comes to terrorism. And at the top of that um, is the violent white supremacy and violent um, militia movements. The third most fatal after that, interestingly, is the incel movement or those predominantly young men that are motivated to commit acts of violence towards young women. Um, and how, how do we prevent this? Well, there's the policies that my colleagues are gonna talk about in the military and the policy within the department, which is very much focused on detecting, disrupting, and preventing threats within department. And I'm really happy with the department's policy on that. It focuses on empowering employees to be aware of what um, radicalization to violence looks like and that they know they can reach out and get help. And that term help is so important. We don't want people to reach out and report to get their friend in trouble. We want people to know that when they reach out and get help, they're actually getting help for that person and that our goal inside the department is to not arrest or fire people. It is to get them help early before things progress towards violence. If you don't have that focus, people won't report. Bystander studies show that over and over and over again. There are barriers to reporting and the number one barrier is that people don't want to get their loved one in trouble. And so we want to emphasize that. Now, of course, if somebody reports somebody and law enforcement looks at it and they're close to an attack, they will be investigated, arrested, and prosecuted. But if they're not, the focus is on getting them help, mental help, mental health assistance, for instance, social services assistance, employee assistance programming to try and pull them off that pathway towards violence in the first place. Um, and then our office is also focused very much on setting up infrastructure outside of the department in communities that military and veterans also benefit from. So if for some reason um, the VA or the military or whatever a department is employing them does not pick up on this radicalization of violence, who does? Family members, loved ones, peers, churchgoers, um, they know their loved ones, their friends better than even um, their employees do, their colleagues at their job, and they will notice that there's changes in behavior that are concerning. Um, when you see these mass attacks happen, whether it's a terrorist attack or a larger mass attack at a school, for instance, two thirds of bystanders in those attacks were concerned and were concerned for their own safety and the well-being of others. And so our office is very much focused on not only raising awareness of the American public of what these behavioral indicators are, um, we're also very focused then on encouraging people to call and get help out in their communities. 
and knowing that, again, it is help. It is not that you will be immediately reported to law enforcement and that there are places to actually call for that help. We do not have that culture of prevention for targeted violence and terrorism in the United States right now. It just doesn't exist. We have good pilot programs here and there. We have seeds being planted. But when you look at suicide prevention, for instance, or substance abuse prevention, you can probably name a few programs in your community that help people with those problems. We need people to be just as aware of targeted violence and terrorism prevention programming, places that they can call that are in their community, run by people that they trust, run by social workers, public health workers, and mental health providers that serve their communities. So that's what we're very much focused on setting up. In the same way there's this culture of suicide prevention, we're trying to create that culture of targeted violence and terrorism prevention and places to call um, that people do trust. And those programs will also serve active duty military and veterans and other employees of, of the U.S. government um, in, in case they fall through the cracks within their own department, in case they don't feel comfortable using those, those resources. Our office does provide resources in addition to that. We do have a grant program for $20 million that we're, we just announced last week, the 2022 uh, awardees. Um, there are programs in there focused on helping military and veterans. We the Veterans, for instance, is one of our uh, grant recipients. We also have staff in 15 locations, soon to be 25 locations across the country, permanently embedded in their, in their communities. And part of their obligation is to form strong relationships with their local VA, with their state department, agency that works with military and veterans and with other community service organizations again to try and build awareness of the resources available to them to help their their communities that they serve um, and and finally um, we have teams that do a number of different um, outreach initiatives so we have a national team focused purely on working with the va the military and veteran servings institutions because sometimes those institutions do an even better job than the VA of, of serving veterans communities to have national level conversations about how we can support veterans and military communities to prevent violent extremism. We had a round table just yesterday with those attending this conference from those backgrounds talking about what more can we do for you in your communities. So you know, we're, we're, it's very much a, a pleasure to be here. My brother is a veteran and um, in former army as well. It's, it's very important to me. Uh, public service is an incredible mission and we want to do all that we can to help military and veterans communities, especially when they're returning from what can be very difficult times overseas um, and, and and in the, in the community and in service. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. James? Uh, so first, thank you for your family service um, and uh, for sharing your story. Uh, it's something no parent should ever have to go through. And so your bravery to come forward and talk about it is, is greatly appreciated by everybody who's heard, heard the story. Um, so as mentioned, my name is James Chappelle. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help out. I, I'm leading the DOD's Insider Threat Management and Analysis Center, or the DITMAC, and that falls under the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, it's DCSA. Um, and so one of the, the major tasks that I have is to evaluate all kinds of risks um, across the Department of Defense and how we can identify potential indicators early, those behaviors uh, of, that will lead to increased risk, and then find ways to get them help uh, so that the, we can get them off of that potential pathway to violence, potential pathway to extremism or espionage. Uh, we have a very wide portfolio of things that we are, we are looking at to try to get after and, and prevent. And so we look at a number of different ways to go about doing that, whether it's, it's through training and education, whether it's through helping um, our, our leaders figure the right way to create a culture that uh, uh, allows for people to come forward and talk about those concerns when they see it in others, 
um, and really trying to move forward with the destigmatization of reporting uh, of potential incidents and helping people to get the help that they might need, uh, whether it's through mental health or through family assistance programs and things like that. So uh, we have a very, like I said, very broad portfolio. We look at a, w a wide number of things, but this is definitely something that falls within that purview of how do we, how do we make sure that these incidents don't take place in the future. Um, and again, go back to what Secretary Austin said. It's the, the vast, vast majority of, of people who serve do so patriotically and do so with, with great valor and um, they're, they're to be applauded. And so how do we find that very small, very small group that uh, is, is utilizing um, their platforms uh, in an inappropriate manner? And so that's, that's really the challenge for us. And uh, we've got a long way ahead, but we are continuing to try to find uh, the right way is forward to create the right environment and culture so that we, we can get people on the right pathway and make sure that they are able to fight and win our, our nation's wars. Thanks, James. Tom, do you want to go? Sure. Yep. Uh, again, Tom Brzozowski. I'm the uh, Council for Domestic Terrorism with the National Security Division in the Department of Justice. Uh, welcome, everybody, virtually in here. Mr. and Mrs. Collins, great glad to see you again. Um, so just, just to frame this out for everybody, so everyone has a kind of a, a, a common understanding of how we, we organize ourselves in, in fight against domestic terrorism, the National Security Division, the Department of Justice, and by extension the FBI um, are charged with investigating and prosecuting domestic terrorist cases. So we, we sit a bit to the right of Jenny's work. Uh, Jenny, Jenny and her team are principally responsible for what, what's called prevention work, that is preventing folks from getting to the point where, a, where they are a target of an FBI investigation. Once they hit that point, um, it's it's our ball game at that. So we're we're a bit of the harder edge uh, of the of the domestic terrorism problem set, if you will. Um, so there's been quite a bit of movement uh, on the policy front with regard to domestic terrorism in recent years. As Jenny rightly noted, the first ever um, national strategy for countering domestic terrorism was issued by the White House uh, like a little over a year and a half ago, maybe two years. Um, and we are actively engaged in uh, implementing uh, the strategic objectives that were mapped out um, by that particular uh, document. So additionally, and Gar I think uh, Garrison, he's going to talk to talk to this a little bit, uh, the DOD also um, revised um, its definition of, of extremism, um, which is which is no small task um, with, with, within the DOD. It's a, it's a giant ship, and it's really hard to turn that thing. Um, so I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, but collectively, those are two pretty signal pieces of, uh, of policy uh, movement as they relate to domestic violent extremism. So how are we at the DOJ and the National Security Division uh, looking to implement some of those uh, strategic, strategic objectives mapped out in the uh, strategy? Well, first and foremost, my boss, the uh, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, uh, recently announced the creation of a domestic terrorism unit within the National Security Division. And that unit um, is tasked with three things. First, there's gonna be an operational component of that unit, which is gonna uh, assist the FBI, work collaboratively with the I, I should say, um, to better, uh, target um, those, those networks and organizations and individuals um, and, and better leverage the, uh, the authorities that we have to hand um, to, to target those individuals in a more aggressive fashion. There's a uh, training, outreach, policy-oriented oriented, um, facet to that. That's principally my line of work. Um, that includes engagement on these issues, which is part of why I'm here today. And then there's, most importantly, perhaps, there's a data element associated with this uh, effort. And that's, that's kind of a big sea change for how we do business in the department. Um, and that data enterprise will effectively require U.S. attorneys' offices all around the country to submit data to Maine Justice uh, on, on their work as it relates to domestic violent extremism. Um, and of course, once we're armed with that data, we're in beta stages right now, uh, we can do quite a number of things on the policy front. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, I, I imagine there may be questions, follow-up questions, but I certainly don't want to cut into Garrison's time. I want to hear <laughs> no about the No worries at all. Yeah. No worries at all. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, my honor to be a part of uh, such a, uh, an esteemed group. Uh, uh, I'm going to pause. I got your name backwards. Bishop I was, Garrison. I was People do it all the time. Garrison. No, I was going to let it go. I'm it's like, fine. that's fine. Right. <laughs> I, have I, two li right. I have two last names. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. <laughs> it's Bishop. I, yeah. so, uh, uh, but it, again, my, the, my esteemed colleagues up here, um, uh, fantastic professionals who've dedicated uh, their lives 
uh, to helping to ensure that uh, our nation is secure and uh, those individuals who serve our nation are also safe. So I greatly appreciate that, and I'm, I'm honored to be here uh, up here with you. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Collins, it's wonderful to see you again, as always, and to finally meet in person. We've done a lot over uh, two, three years, two and a half years, uh, back and forth on phones and on Zooms and on uh, emails, and we finally today had the opportunity to meet uh, in person. So lovely to see you, and thank you for uh, uh, everything you've done from, from great tragedy to try to help so many people uh, throughout this country. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Bishop Garrison. I'm a former uh, senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense for Human Capital, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. Uh, in that role, I also uh, I served on a myriad of, uh, of different uh, uh, major tasks for the Secretary uh, to include um, uh, the uh, Independent Review Commission on Sexual Assault, Sexual Harassment. Uh, but more importantly, in this capacity, I was the lead for the uh, Countering Violent Extremism Working Group uh, within the military. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, my colleagues up here uh, mentioned, uh, something that uh, both Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks always focused on was the vast majorities of those who serve do so uh, honorably. Uh, the piece I add to this that we always uh, continue to, uh, to bring home was that we understand that uh, extremism at some level exists in a very minute or small way, and that very small group has the potential to have an outsized impact. Uh, given the, the operations and the mission of the department from uh, day to day. So it's incredibly important for us to ensure that we do everything we can to mitigate uh, that threat uh, as it may exist. And that was a part of why the uh, April 9th memo that established the working group was, uh, was uh, written and, uh, and developed. Uh, as uh, Tom mentioned, we've already, uh, excuse me, the department, I'm no longer in uh, the, uh, the Biden administration. I'm now, as, uh, as Ryan mentioned, a, a vice president president for a tech firm, but the department really did uh, focus as a part of our uh, uh, immediate actions, and one thing I want to talk about here, and we can start taking questions uh, after this, was on the definition of what extremist activity actually meant. Uh, and the reason that that was uh, one of our immediate actions is, one, we, uh, we owe it to our, our leaders, both uh, the service uh, uniform leadership as well as civilian leaders to provide them with a clear and, con and as concise as we can naturally make it uh, definition of what extremist activity is. So when they're speaking to their subordinates, uh, everyone is speaking from the same foundational understanding. So uh, in order for us to do that, we revisited what's known as a, a DOD instruction or a DOTI, and that uh, was 1325.06. That is the one that governs uh, political activity uh, within the department and, uh, and all those who serve the department. And uh, we made this a holistic effort. This was a whole, uh, really a whole of government uh, um, effort whenever it really came down to it. And what I mean to say is first internally, uh, we had a little over 100 individuals that worked in total uh, within the uh, working group, but uh, particularly on the military justice and policy side, we had dedicated folks from across the fourth estate, from across the services, from across the joint staff uh, that, that worked uh, tirelessly uh, in this effort to ensure that we were getting as much of the input across from leaders and subordinates as well to understand uh, the issue at hand and to get uh, their take, their understanding of what it, actual extremist activity was, given that they were the individuals that this policy would ultimately govern. After that, we had our leadership review it, they take their cuts, and then luckily we were able to send uh, that definition through our uh, OGC as well as our IG reviews over to DOJ. And then their top uh, constitutional scholars and lawyers took their cuts on it on two separate occasions. So uh, the reason I kind of uh, I give that, that short story is the idea that this was one of uh, the most well-reviewed, uh, uh, well-regarded policy development processes I have ever been a part of because it was so important to get this right. When you're speaking of not only keeping individuals safe but protecting constitutional rights, uh, civil rights and civil liberties of those that this policy would govern, we had to go through uh, that intricately detailed process in order to uh, do our best to get it right. So that was only one aspect of this overall effort that uh, the working group took on. Uh, ultimately, we uh, 
uh, we're directed to finish this within uh, uh, 90 days. And as anyone who's ever worked with or for DOD knows, 90 days mm -hmm. timeline is never going to work. Uh, so ultimately, it took us uh, a, a little over uh, about six and a half months to really get the type of quality and product out that, uh, that we will. I know we'll have some questions and discussions on this, but I will say that I thank uh, Secretary Austin and Dep Deputy Secretary Hicks for their efforts on this. I thank our colleague uh, Josh Geltzer as well, the Deputy Assistant to the President for uh, Homeland Security, as well as uh, uh, the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security, Liz Trouble Randall, uh, because of the White House's support um, and their acumen and uh, it just overall their inputs throughout the entirety of that process to get uh, what we got. Uh, we had one of the most historic uh, documents and efforts ever put forth, quite frankly, uh, within the department and its history, uh, and we were able to deliver that. Does that mean it was perfect? Absolutely not. Does that mean that there is more that can be and should be done? Absolutely. But this is a starting point like we have not seen on this topic ever in this department, and I'm uh, very thankful and honored to have been a part of that. And with that, I expect you. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you everyone for sharing those amazing updates. <clears throat> I do want to recognize, I mean, you, like you said, Bishop, it's not perfect. Nothing we're going to do is perfect. Um, but it's just so much action in the last two years that the government has taken. And when you look at the kind of speed of government, it is actually kind of monumental in terms of how much has gotten done. The first question we have submitted from, the, from uh, someone who is watching um, is about this concept of, it's great that you're doing more. Uh, kind of, how do we measure success? So the question is, uh, how is the government holding itself accountable for demonstrating that it is doing better? How do we measure success? So I want to talk about some of these initiatives in a minute. But but how, what's the kind of goal in terms of not only not only what what does success look like, but how do you talk about it? That's questions for anyone. Okay, I can start and yeah. we can go back down that way. Uh, for me, you always have to have some level of metrics associated with any type of effort like this, even with policy where it uh, is not necessarily as, as quantitative as, as you would like it to be, more qualitative. Uh, but you have to have a what does right ultimately look like, what is our, our uh, end goals. For me, it's the implementation of the policy that you have now directed. Uh, for us, we had some initial immediate actions and all of those were taken care of by the time that we uh, placed the, uh, the uh, report out to the public and we understood that there was uh, some continuous follow-on things. So some of the immediate actions for us, not only on top of the uh, uh, the definition I mentioned, but uh, the TAPS program, transition assistance, uh, making sure that uh, service members who were transitioning from service understood that there was a, a real potential for them to be up, approached and potentially recruited by uh, groups that are aligned with extremist activity. And that does not necessarily uh, j only mean uh, those based on uh, a race when you talk about white supremacy or white nationalists. It also means a lot of anti-government uh, and militia groups that are looking for individuals individuals that have the experience and the skill set uh, of these uh, particularly uh, younger veterans, but also individuals that are uh, leaving a very structured community in the military that now have a vacuum of structure and may be looking for that feeling of family and that feeling of, uh, of being a part of something greater, and that's where they kind of uh, slip in into that role. Uh, so, so being able to complete some of those uh, smaller tasks at the outset I think is a part of uh, that metric for us. And then seeing just the timeline, where are you in the phased approach uh, in your uh, implementation? Are you meeting the, uh, the timeline, the goals that you've set forth uh, for putting something like this forward? Right, data. Data is where, where it is. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the easiest uh, metric that you can, you can offer up to folks. And as I said in my earlier comments, that's, that's precisely what we're trying to do a better job of recognizing, of course, that in the past we hadn't. Um, the DOJ, that is, um, been, been the best at, at collecting data associated with domestic violent extremism. Um, and so you know, we've implemented, again, some, some pretty novel policy, uh, policies that are directly related to securing better data so we can be more transparent with the, the broader public. Um, and as a consequence, the broader public will have a, a better and a deeper understanding of precisely what we're doing in this arena. Um, because we do recognize, of course, um, that domestic terrorism is, by its very nature, Political and is political, um, and regrettably, um, many have, have, have begun to use it as something of a political cudgel these days. And so, to the more transparent we can be with the broader public uh, in terms of what, what we are doing and how we are le leveraging the authorities that we've been afforded to fight domestic terrorism, um, 
my, you know, my hope, of course, is that it will cut into this, um, this uh, tendency, this regrettable tendency uh, for folks to, to wield uh, domestic terrorism as, some, as something as, uh, of a political, um, as I said, a political cudgel. I, you know, another, other things we can do, uh, other uh, institutionalized training. Um, so we're, we're looking to collaborative, uh, develop some collaborative training with the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Defense. Um, and so if we, if we can bake that in to institutionalize it instead of you know, doing the ad hoc one-off training, uh, which, which we're doing right now, of course, um, but institutionalizing and making sure that it's, it's, it's baked into the, to the training re regimens both at the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, I, mean, I think that's another a rock solid uh, indicator of progress being made. And then to, to, to Bishop's point, hitting our, our markers. We, we've been assigned certain responsibilities uh, as a result of this national strategy, certain objectives, certain deliverables. Uh, we, the Department of Justice, all of us really at the federal level. Um, and we've got to tick through those and just get the, get our, get, do our homework and get, our, get, our, get the job done. Yeah, so this is <clears throat> metrics data. Those are the, the, one of the real challenges when you talk about insider risk, insider threat. It's, it's kind of like uh, intelligence. It's how do you prove that you stopped an attack if an attack didn't take place? Was it because you, you, you know, rallied the troops to stop the attack, or is it because it was bad intel, right? Um, same thing, how do you prove that you stop somebody from committing workplace violence activity, or how do you prove that you stop somebody from being taking extremist action, right? Um, it, it's one of the real challenges. And so one of the things that we are looking at right now is how we evolve our systems capability, systems-based capability, to look at the actions that are taken based off of the behaviors that we see. And so what I mean by that is, if we see somebody exhibiting behaviors that could be indicative of extremist behavior, what actions, what referrals were taken, um, what recommendations were made, what referrals or actions were taken, and then what was the end result? You know, what the, is it something that it went to the prosecutorial side? Was it something that we were able to, to catch it early enough and, and demonstrate the value of prevention programs that are there and the resiliency programs that are there? And so we're really trying to get more, more detailed into the life cycle, which is a challenge because now you're asking a lot of other folks to share their information and their data as well. And so uh, we're working through some of those unique uh, challenges there. I, I will never be able to tell you we stopped X number of people from becoming extremists or X number of people from committing workplace violence or committing espionage. But my goal is that by a certain period, we'll be able to tell you how many people we have referred to law enforcement or counterintelligence or to you know, mental health. Those types of programs where we can hopefully get to that, and then for success for me, the ultimate success is how many people did we get back into the formation? How many people are now able to, to function and do their job again? Mm -hmm. right? Because that to me is the ultimate success, is getting them back in there and doing the things that you know, we, we all expect them to do from a military perspective. So um, a, a, a tough, tough challenge to answer. I think that you know, uh, what was said earlier is right on too. We've got to meet some of the, the timelines that we've got. We've got to get those programs implemented. Um, but ultimately, what's the return on investment? We've got to be able to show that those things that we did are resulting in actions that are positive or, or, or ultimately positive for the organization. So. Yeah, I agree with all of my colleagues here. Metrics are so important. And there are metrics that you can collect to show success, even if you can't prove that you stopped an attack. And that's our, our, our issue, too. And I, I think we're collecting similar metrics. But, you know, there's a lot of questions to ask, though, like, what does success look like? Um, does it mean that we are able to measure a decrease in violent extremism across the United States? Are we trying to measure how well we serve our communities and getting them the resources that they need? Um, and, and so I think you first have to start with that. And for us, it's how do we, how well do we as an office build the capacity of our communities and offer resources to them to be able to then set up effective prevention programming? And then we help them also create their own system of metrics um, because there is a diffusion of the work. We, as the federal government, are not actually intervening with cases of violent extremism to pull them off that pathway. We're building the capacity of our federal, state, and local governments and civil society to be able to do that. So we are measuring how well we are serving our communities, the number of trainings that we're giving, the number of grants that we give out. 
We are asking our grantees to measure success also. How well does their program actually stop violent extremism? Um, and you know, some of the metrics that they'll be collecting, for instance, is number of referrals. We actually also measure how well is our local community now doing violence prevention after the, we gave them resources versus before. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can, can, um, can measure success, and those are the ways that we've defined it. But I'll tell you know, anybody who's a metrics nerd in the room, I'll nerd out a little bit. Like you need to have, it takes a long time just to define your metrics. You need to have a theory of change. You need to have um, a strategy then outlining your goals against that. You need to have um, then defining the ways that you're going to collect that data for how long, how are you actually going to collect the data. And so we're running through all of those different um, needs and assessments right now and figuring that out. We're also helping our, our communities define their own theory of change and their own, um, their own strategic planning efforts. So that's a long-winded answer to say, we do think we can measure prevention success, but there's a lot of different ways to do it, and it deserves to be thought through well um, and thoroughly. Thank you, and we got a few questions along a similar theme, so I'm gonna try to kind of paraphrase them to say, you know, on the topic of kind of civil liberties or politiz politicization, as we're implementing the policies you're outlining, we don't want to become that which we condemn. We don't want to violate civil liberties. We don't want to be going after people because of their politics, becoming thought police. How do you build into your process those types of protections mm -hmm. that limit government overreach? Sure, I'll go ahead and start with that. So, you know, the, the federal government actually has a lot of um, protections for civil rights and civil liberties. And the fact that, for instance, in, in Tamil, I'll say this as well, the FBI cannot investigate somebody who has very strong beliefs, even if they're professing them on Facebook and they're saying, we hate all Jews, all Jews should be killed. Even that is not enough of a direct threat, for instance, for somebody to be investigated unless there's other pieces of evidence. So there's actually really strong um, protections for um, speech including hate speech in our country that other country that other countries don't face as much as us. And so there is actually already in place, I think, strong protections for ideologies, um, barring investigations until there is enough evidence to suggest that somebody is planning something. I say that those protections obviously need to be there. Our freedom of speech is part of our First Amendment. Um, um, amongst a number of other freedoms to protest. For instance, those who showed up on January 6th and were protesting peacefully very much had the right to be there and were not prosecuted for that, right? It's those that stormed the Capitol, showed up with intentions um, to kidnap members of Congress, for instance, and hang them on the lawn. And I think that's glossed over by the media a lot. Um, and so those protections should be there. I will say that's why federal government cannot lead prevention efforts. We train communities to set up programs because they can, in that phase, before any type of criminal behavior is happening, they can intervene, right? If somebody has hateful speech and a number of other risk factors, they can intervene then when we as a federal government or even state and local law enforcement probably couldn't. And so. Um, I think protection for civil rights and civil liberties is important. It's built into all of our programming. It's built into all the training we do. We emphasize, for instance, that the First Amendment protections are, are important for our way of life and are not part of the work that we do. Um, and you know, I know that's really important to some of our critics who are very concerned about us infringing on people's beliefs, religion, speech, right to peacefully assemble. So that's a constant conversation we're having with them. And I think we've made progress in particular in the past year. Ryan has helped us a lot with that in gathering these different groups together and emphasizing how our approaches are very mindful of, of civil rights and civil liberties. I, I would yeah. just like to add, I know, I, and I'm, I'm sure some of the, qu the questions were pointed towards this, that there's a slight nuance when you talk about the military. 
mm. uh, because you're talking about service members who are sure. uh, governed under UCMJ. Uh, and for us, it really goes back to the good order and discipline of the units and the uh, commander's uh, ability uh, to ensure that those units can, uh, can be mission ready and mm -hmm. that you don't have uh, individuals that are, that are in any way being disruptive. And ultimately, that's how you may ensure that it's not about one particular ideology. Mm -hmm. It's about whether or not you're, you're ultimately disrupting uh, critical missions that could put potential uh, individuals' lives in danger. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way we approached it. It was never for us, and, I, and uh, to Jay's point, I, I know you had, we have a lot of critics out there that uh, want to speak about, oh, you're targeting a particular group or a particular uh, belief structure, and that's never the case. Uh, it really is a, a hard and uh, steadfast idea of the, the uh, officers in charge, the NCOs in charge, having the ability to keep their units safe and on task mm -hmm. uh, and uh, engaging in their mission. Sorry, Tom. No, no, no worries. I, I, Jenny raised a great point. Um, you know, first front and cent center of, of, of the FBI's policy, the government's how they do business is this mantra um, that the FBI shall not uh, initiate an investigation based solely on uh, someone's exercise of their First Amendment rights. Uh, you see it throughout. And I will tell you that there's a reason that that's there because there's a, an unfortunate historical legacy associated with how we in the federal government have conducted domestic security operations in the past. Um, back in the, in the all, all the way up to the early 70s, and many of you be aware that there was a, a church committee investigation, which was kind of a watershed moment in our history, um, and what that, with the result of that investigation, was more or less a wholesale reordering of how uh, we do, we the federal government do business in the domestic security realm, um, and some of the results of that include things like the attorney general guidelines um, for con conducting domestic um, operations. That's, that's, the, that's the policy that directs how the DOJ does work, its work. And then um, below that, there's the, uh, the DIOG. It's the, that's, the, that's, a, that's, a, that's a phrase, it's the Domestic in Investigations Operations Guide. That's the manual uh, that the FBI lives by that tells it how to do its work. Um, and these documents are, they're, the through line throughout is this, is this understanding and awareness that, again, um, nobody, uh, no one in the federal government uh, can initiate an investigation based solely on someone's exercise of the First Amendment rights. And I, I have to say that uh, um, one thing that we, you know, that we focus, exclu something, ex focus exclusively on um, at the DOJ and the National Security Division is violence. Um, so in, in many respects, the nature of the ideology that animates that violence is, from a legal pers perspective, broad, broadly immaterial. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, we, we become concerned um, and, and enter into the fray when we have indicators that suggest that an individual is looking to do, um, to, to do um, service to an ideology through violence, not necessarily what that ideology may or may not be. And that's a key point to make sure that the that, that folks out there uh, understand. And so all these policy changes that we've talked about up here um, carry that, that, that mantra forward. Um, so it's not lost on us um, how important civil liberties are to, the, to this whole equation because at the end of the day, the department is charged with both investigating and prosecuting domestic terrorism while at the same time upholding the civil liberties of all Americans. Yeah, privacy civil liberties is one of the, the required trainings to work in insider risk, insider threat within the federal government. So it's something that we, we continue to work with our folks on to make sure they understand the boundaries of, of what we can evaluate, what we can look at, and how we can utilize that forward. Um, and I think the other thing that we, we try very hard to get back to some of the baseline of that question is um, evaluating our, our bias and taking uh, you know, unconscious bias training and things like that. So we, we aren't uh, starting to stray on, in one direction or another from a, uh, from a political perspective, right? Because we need to be the ones who hold that strong middle of the road and, and evaluate things from a, uh, a non-biased perspective and make sure that we are walking the tightrope of of making sure that people are, are going to get home safe. So um, built, baked into the program. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to say, you know, as the non-government person here, uh, it's an incredibly different political environment to get anything done right now. These issues have been politicized. Yeah. Um, it has been very difficult uh, to get policymakers to truly make these uh, issues, this, this hate-fueled violence issue, a priority. So I want to say, as a for I'll say that as a non-government person now, but as a former government person, I worked at the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, and the White House, and I want to say for the last two years to have a national strategy to counter domestic terrorism, the counter-extremism working group uh, at the Department of Defense, a new uh, terrorism prevention program at, at, at DHS, 
is a huge amount of progress. And so as was acknowledged, I want to say not perfect, just like nothing is going to be perfect, but a huge amount of progress when facing you know, political headwinds. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for your service and for pushing the ball forward. Um, in terms of the work, this is to be continued. This is a, this is a forever challenge. Uh, in terms of our panel, we are going to conclude there. Uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, the Collins family, thank you so much for, for telling your story, uh, as always. And we'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up to the, for the next panel. Thanks.